parents and the friends. They're just there. They're all in the like, take your, take your euro to go Okay, leave. I can change Be nice. <laughs> at, at six o'clock, uh, uh, there'll be the lightning talks if you want to participate. I don't know if you can still propose topics, but go there and find out. In the meanwhile, let me introduce uh, Luis, uh, who will tell us how to better manage our cluster clusters. How you doing? My name is Luis Pavon, and now I work for Red Hat Storage. I'm a principal engineer there. And this is actually a picture that my sister sent me. I guess uh, somebody saw me and they created me in uh, the Big Hero 6 movie. So I'm there in the Big Hero 6 movie and I'm at a conference, just like this. <laughs> Except I'm a little younger there, so I don't have as much white. So, but, um, so let's take a little history to understand why, what is the need for Hecate and why it was created. When we first started with uh, Gloucester FS, uh, we wanted to integrate it with OpenStack Manila. And if you know what Manila is, it's trying to provide file shares as a service. So you, got, uh, in, you have uh, Cinder, for example, in OpenStack, provides block. You have uh, Swift, it provides uh, objects. So the new project for Manila wanted to provide file. And to do that, we wanted to be able to use GlusterFS as a backend storage for Manila. So that came with some. Uh, new areas and new models that Gloucester first needed to, to adhere to. And that's where Project Hecate was created. So let's, before we go ahead and start talking about Hecate, what it does and what it's trying to solve, let's first try to understand what GlusterFS is and how it's created. How do you go ahead and create a volume? First, what is GlusterFS? Does anybody have not done, uh, doesn't know what GlusterFS is? Yeah, get out of here. So uh, <laughs> anybody else? Uh, so as you probably know, GlusterFS is a distributed, reliable file system that you can access from multiple protocols. So you can access it from uh, NFS, from Samba, you can access it from Object, from Swift, and you can access it over Fuse and also from API format. So at this uh, unit of usage is really a volume. So when you want to go ahead and uh, access GlusterFS, the very first thing you have to think about is, is the volume. You have to create this entity out of your storage, and that's how you end up using GlusterFS. But then, how do you create a volume? So, the very first thing you have to do when you want to start using GlusterFS is decide what systems you want to use for. Once you decide the systems, you decide what storage in that system you would like to use. Once you decide that, then you start dividing it. You start creating, uh, taking one system and joining it with another, what's called peer probing, and then extending your trusted pool. So now two nodes become a trusted pool. And as you add more and more nodes with storage, it become as a larger trusted pool. So then <coughs> you have 
not only the storage, you have to decide what to use, but then you have to also set up a file system on that storage. And let me explain why. Why? So, let me go before I go to the next one. ClusterFS has three models. So it has a volume, and a volume is a collection of bricks. And each brick, when I first started at ClusterFS at Red Hat Storage, and I asked actually this question, what is cluster face and how you set it up? And they said, well, you know, it's a volume. And they set up bricks. And I said, well, hold on a second. What, what, what is a brick? And they said, well, it's a directory. But they just call it that. But call it the, anyway, it's kind of confusing. But a brick is really just a directory. And many bricks, you can join them together to become a volume. Now, depending on how many bricks you need, it all is dependent on the durability model that you choose. For example, you could say, I want replica 2. I want EC, and those kind of type of requirements on your volume determine the number of bricks that you need to actually create it. So for example, here we have three nodes, and those three nodes we created, each one has three directories. And those three directories may be on a RAID, they could be on a disk. It depends on how you want to decide how to actually create those, those, uh, those, that storage. You then to create the volume, you, you have to almost like unify these, but you create a volume out of these many bricks that you have actually created across the many systems. Now I want to point out here that once you create the volume, here we have for, uh, set up the durability model of Replica 2. And then for, uh, in this model we have six bricks. Now, it's really interesting to see here also that we have chosen that server one, this brick, its replica is the one after that. And second, it's the second brick, and its replica is the one after that. So you have to be very careful how you organize these in the command line. Okay? Lastly, you then start the volume, and then you can go ahead and mount it. And when you mount that volume over Gloucester FS, then you get the nice, uh, unified storage of the volume. But there's an issue here. So anybody can tell me what the issue is with this model in the cloud? Yes, exactly. Somebody typed this. And that is not scalable. This only works at the model of the request, the number of requests per second. So for example, if you get one request per week to create a volume, this is great. And Gluster First works great at the Nash model, where you can create a massive amount of storage. You know, and the, the volume becomes uh, available for a long time. But in the cloud, you got volumes that are small, you got volumes that have so much lifetime, they come in, they come out. We, each one of us has different durability models. Some of us have EC models, some of us have Replica 3, some 2. And we want those volumes now, as soon as I press the button for the request. So we need a new way to be able to achieve this. So <laughs> this is the face when you look at when somebody has to type that for every time. <laughs> but we need a new way to go ahead and achieve this. And that is what Hecate is trying to bring in. So in, Hecate itself is a REST service that has an intelligent algorithm inside once you depending on the topology of your, of your data center. So it takes that information that you provide for your data center and then it goes ahead and creates uh, many volumes according to the requests that are coming in. And again, Hecate is not really supposed to be used by uh, administrators and such. It's supposed to be a service for something that provides multi-tenancy, something like Kubernetes, something like OpenStack Manila, or any other system that maybe a, a hospital or something else that is uh, local only for a private cloud. This is the architecture of Hecate today. It is uh, HTTP uh, framework on the top. It has a middleware where we can add more services in the future, but today it only has the uh, education. It can go ahead and uh, has a uh, database to be able to track all your storage across the entire data center. And then it has these things at the bottom 
they're really a plugin model. So today, Hecate is very young in its software, so we just have enough information there to be able to uh, have the allocator. So here's the allocator that decides where to put uh, the bricks in what system, in what node, in what zone. And we'll go into zones in a second. But it's one algorithm. We can probably come up with uh, more efficient ones in the future so that we just plug some in there. And here, what now, we have an SSH executor, which means that Hecate wants actually to go into a system and and set up commands in that system. Today we just SSH in there, but there's nothing in the future that says we can have a REST system, a REST interface or something else, or we could have Ansible there or something else. So let's take a look at the workflow. Let's say, for example, you have a data center and you want to start using Hecate for it. So the very first thing you did before with ClusterFS is that you rolled in your, your, uh, your racks of service and you have your storage and you started deciding what to use and you started deciding how to uh, set up your storage, maybe you did RAID or not, and then you have to set up your file systems and such. But let's go now in the Hecate model. You again roll in your storage, your racks, and that's it. That you have to install Linux, of course, on it and then set up a cluster, but that's pretty much it. The next thing you say is, I need to tell Hecate about the, my new storage systems. First, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a cluster. A cluster is just a collection of nodes. And on that cluster that I created, this entity, I'm going to add my first node to it. So I add a node. But now we have more information that we're giving it than we did before. We're not just adding a node, but we're saying this node is on this zone, this failure domain. So as we start adding more nodes, we start dividing the failure domains. So before, in GlossRFS, you had to think about that information. You had to understand where to place the break, make sure its replica was not in the same failure domain as your other replicas. But in this model, Hecate will do this for you. You just have to explain these, this rack is sharing the same switch or the same power supply, and this other rack is sharing the same switch. So that we have two different zones here and one cluster. And as we add more and more nodes, Hecate itself will start adding, uh, the, creating the trusted, the trusted, uh, trusted storage pool. My goodness. <laughs> Next thing we need to do with Hecate is we added the nodes, we, added the, uh, we defined the zones, Next, we start adding the storage. So on that node, for example, we add each one of these disks or devices. They could be RAID devices. So we're, in other words, we're telling Hecate, this is our topology of our system. Not only can Hecate do one cluster, so when people think of ClusterFS, they always normally think of one cluster, one trusted uh, pool. I'm not stop saying that. <laughs> but Hecate can handle any number of clusters. So that means now, before you thought, you know, you maybe had some constraints on the amount of cluster FS, how large you could go, but instead of thinking just one massive volume, you could think of many, many endless number of volumes. Okay? So now let's take a, uh, just a normal request to create a volume. What's the very first thing that Hecate does? It goes ahead and it has an algorithm to determine where um, am I first? How many bricks am I going to use to satisfy this request? It calculates all of that. Then it says, all right, let me go ahead and, make, and see which one of the devices can satisfy this brick that I need to uh, place on there. So it goes ahead looking in the topology, looking for devices that I can use. So as you can see here, in this replica two example, we have a device chosen on zone one and a different device chosen on zone two, and that's its replica, and it did that automatically. And then if this is a distributed volume, then it will go ahead and create the other two, and one in one zone and one in the other. The really cool thing about Hecate 2 is you can say, when you create the volume, the request to create it, you, you don't have to specify the cluster, and it will just find a volume somewhere for you. Or you can specify the cluster specifically. I say, I want a cluster on that, I'm sorry, I want a volume on that cluster. Maybe 
the request is coming from somebody who's paying more, for, for example, SSD, uh, or paying less, so you just say that. And then, or you can say, I want it from this subset of clusters. Okay, maybe you have many clusters of SSD or many clusters of SATA. All right, so what other features does it support? It supports, you can say to Haketi, like, create a replica three, we create EC, create in this, so it's very easy for Haketi to do this all for you, and, and it's all available from the API. So, um, and also it supports volume expansion. It's a, which is kind of neat because as you create a volume, you may need to increase the amount of storage that you require, and it will go ahead looking again for new bricks to satisfy that request. So, yeah? How are we determining that which library type is being used? On the request, the requester asks for that. I want a volume of Replica 3. The, the requester asks. Mm -hmm. In the in the uh, API request, in the JSON, you say you, you, can, you can specify uh, durability type. And there is uh, none, which means there's nothing. Just, there is just uh, distributed. There's replica style, or there is EC. So you define that in the request. Well, how does it know the storage devices? How does it know the storage devices? The, going back here, the administrator, when he first rolls in those machines, the very first thing he does, or her, is to roll, to tell Hakeri all the topology information. That is, uh, failure domain, nodes, devices. That's all you need to tell. And then Hakeri takes care of the rest. That, that may be difficult thing. If you have 600 or more than 100 devices in a node. Yeah. Listing out all these, telling Hakeri all those devices may be difficult. No, no, it's not difficult because uh, normally these machines come uh, uh, like already set up, and all you have to do is Hikari send. Uh, it's just remember, it's not from the command line. This is a service, so uh, some software will and to tell Hikari of all these devices. Yes, and it's completely concurrent, except uh, in parallel. So you can tell Hikari as with a hundred requests at a time. Yeah. Remember the storage devices. 60 devices means you have to enter 60 device names or how do you maybe can throw them? You are going to throw them away. Right? Yes. <laughs> so I guess you are ready for the demo. <laughs> All right. Okay, so let's go to the demo here. And this demo is available on the uh, Hikeri website. You can go ahead and try it out yourself. It is based on Vagrant and Ansible. So I already ran the Ansible and Vagrant, so I haven't done anything else. So from this point on, is just following the instructions that are on the website, okay? And I'm sure we'll go in, you'll answer questions, you can ask me, we can type other things and things like that, but uh, here we go. So the very first thing we're gonna do is enable the Hikeri service. So Hikeri, actually I'm gonna talk about this in a little bit, but Hikeri is available in Fedora, it's available on EPEL, it's going to be available on CentOS and Storage SIG, and it's available also as a container. So, and it's available in RHS as a tech preview. Yeah. So, this is do Vagrant, SSH, Storage It's available in RHS. You said it's in EPEL. It's in EPEL, yes, yes. So the very first thing we're going to do here is um, look at the demo. And if I can find it, here we go. So the very first thing we're going to do is copy a configuration file. So we're here. And Hikari uses, ah, oh, of course. Hikari uses a configuration file in JSON and it describes the web port to listen to and such and what authentication and what user to use. And then we have at the bottom <clears throat> some information that it's needed to be able to SSH. Just like if you use Ansible in any other system, you need to provide your private key for all your systems. And the requirement right now is to have the same public key and private key for all your systems that you want to manage. 
So here we have, we do SC copy Hecate adjacent to slash etc Hecate. All right, next step, we're going to start our service. As you do service, start. So there it is. It is now running on, on this system, OK? So now we can have some fun and uh, get some information from it. Here's a REST client available on Firefox. Uh, you can try it out. But uh, what we'll do is we'll say HTTP. We'll get all the clusters on that. <coughs> Looks like there's an issue with the networking. All right. I'll do it from the side. So let's go back here. So the next step we're going to do is use the command line client. Now, Hikedi provides a command line client as an example. So don't, when you use the command line client, you say, oh, man, this is terrible. You know, it's so specific to the API. But that's what it's supposed to do. That's its goal. It's a demo of how the API can be used. And hopefully, services will be able to combine those APIs into one call that is more humanly yeah, usable. So here we have Hekeri CLI, and uh, we can, it's available. You can do, talk about the clusters. We can talk about nodes. So the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to say, give me the cluster information. Look at me cluster list. And there's no clusters, because there's nothing. We haven't done anything yet. It doesn't, there's no topology yet. And so, Ramesh, I'm going to ask you your question now. And this is where services really help. For example, I did add one service call to Hikedi client because it could take some time for me to type every device in the system. And I called it the, to load the topology. And what it is is a JSON file that has the entire topology of my cluster available. OK, so we have uh, many nodes. Each node has an IP address and has some devices that describes what zone that is on. Okay. So we'll just run this. We'll say um, Hikari CLI load H. And we'll say JSON topology divert. And there it goes. So Hikari. Now, this is slowed down. I don't have to do one at a time. I could have just sent all the devices to it and it would have done all in parallel. But just for, I think there's a problem here with my vagrant and standby of the machine. But uh, one second. So this is slowed down. So what it's going right now is creating the nodes. It went to the devices. And it went ahead and created the V, set up the storage for usage. And it, I probably can't ping 192.168.10.101. Yep, that's what I thought. So when it says adding device, uh, you yeah. mentioned on the slide LVM. Does it provision it as physical volumes and on top of it, yeah. does LVM and each, uh, each brick will be an LVM? And a, thin, a thin pool, and then there'll be an, uh, small, an LV on top of that. Yep. So. Let's, uh, let me go back out of this because it seems to, when you go on standby, it seems like. Yeah. Hold on a second. <coughs> what? Oh, just halt it. Halt it. See that works. All right. So, what's your question? The what? The topology of the yeah, the topology of the system. Instead, you could discover using the. It, that's, that's what I'm saying. The service takes care of that. The service who calls the case can. Can either have it done by human so, person. So you could discover. If, what, what I'm saying is that the, the service can discover that information. However, it gets it, it then supplies it to Hikari. So why not Hikari discovering those? Because 
I, I'll explain why. It, every data center in every place is different, and the services understand those data centers. So those, the, the, data, the services themselves understand what's going on, and Kenny doesn't know, right? So if the services can provide that information, however they access it, then that's probably the, the, the right model. All right, so let me try this again. So let me say shut down. All right, remove. All right, let's try this again. Three. Ah, of course. There it goes. You know, live demos always are terrible. Let me go back with a recording you have. Uh, where is it? I can't tell you access. There we go. What? <laughs> uh, do you have DLC or something? No, no, that's all good. I'll take care of it from the web. You yes, know, when things happen, you know? All right, here we go. It's right here. Hopefully I have a Wi-Fi now. Come on. Here it comes. Uh, there's a cable to the desktop to the Oh, I don't have uh, Ethernet port. So I have Wi-Fi, or I should. Wow. Oh, yeah, you're right. Thank you. Ugh. Thank you. All right, so we'll do the same thing. We set up the system. Here it is running. We'll go into storage zero, we'll go and load the information, the story, the topology. Okay? And then on the back side, while I'm showing the, uh, the topology coming up, I'm showing the logs of it going actually into the systems and getting the, in setting them up. So once the, the topology is set, I'm trying to get rid of that bar at the bottom, sorry. Then it goes, we can go ahead and say cluster info, we should be able to get information. Now we can get information on a specific system. And everything in Hecate is done with UUID. So every device, every node, every cluster has a different UUID. So everything can be referenced uniquely. So here we have the node information and we can see all the devices that are available in that system. We also can get an IP address and what cluster it belongs to. So here we have, uh, we're gonna start looking at the volume information and then we can start looking at the create information in a second and we can look at the help file inside of it. So in create, as you can see from the example here, we have a lot of options of what you can actually request. You can request, uh, I think somebody pointed out uh, durability type, but you can, you can have dairy type, you can use EC, you can also specify how much storage do you want for snapshots in this volume. For example, if you don't want snapshots at all, or you want a lot of room for your snapshots. So let's see here, we have, we're trying to create a one terabyte size volume. It goes ahead with looking at the logs on the backside and Hecate has decided already what systems and what devices is going to use. And it went ahead and started setting them up with LVs, thin pools, make FS, all that stuff. It, it joined them all into one volume for you. And now we can go to the client and we can see that there's nothing mounted. We go ahead and mount that node and UUID. 
and MKFS happens uh, when you create the volume yes. or when you provision the machine? When you create the volume. It happens on demand. Yeah, because you need a size. Exactly right. Yes. So you create a, an LV for every brick, yes. and then if actually you, you first create a thin pool for on top of FVG, depending the thin pool size, depending of, of the amount of LV that's needed for the brick, and the rest needed for snapshots. So then it, once it does that, then it does make a fast and set up the entire brick. No, I mean entire cluster volume. One question: Is that in real time? This is not in real time. And some some parts were accelerated. You had to ask that. That looked cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Some parts were accelerated. And actually, yeah, I try to keep it less than five minutes. So, so here, then, once we have volume, then we have uh, the ability to expand the volume. So we can say we give it the UID of the, uh, of the volume, and we then describe how much more space we want. This is really cool. This, man, I... I I'm surprised that sometimes QMU has issues with networking when the laptop was in standby, but I wanted to show you that you can create a volume, have it mounted, go back to the Kitty, expand the volume, and watch it on the mounted system, actually the size increase of it. So it's pretty nice. So here we have a volume expansion. And we go back to the client, a little bit, you can see from the volume info that it's expanded. We go back to the client and mount the system, and there it is at 1.2 terabytes. We added 200 gigs to it. So now we go mount it. The last thing we're going to do is destroy it. So again, as a service, you have to be able to create, expand, destroy. Those are the three things. So I can't get rid of the bar in the bottom, but I just typed Heketi volume destroy in the UID, and it goes ahead. <coughs> To, first, it stops the volume. It goes ahead and deletes all the LVs and then puts everything back so that it, it deallocates all that storage so available to somebody else. Okay. No, we're not watching it again. <laughs> okay. So let's go back here. And like I mentioned before, this is available right now. You can try it out. You can try it as a container really easily. So when I showed you before, the architecture has uh, what's called an <coughs> different executors to be able to send information to a system. But it also has something called a mock executor. So when you download the container, you'll first, actually when you download any of these, it's first set up with a mock executor, meaning you can create clusters, you can create nodes. It doesn't send information anywhere. But you can check out and try out the API. Lastly, what's next for the project? So it's still kind of in a baby. It, uh, we started in about uh, July, June, July. Uh, and the next thing we have to do is conflict resolution, which is kind of a simple thing. But if you just haven't had time, it's when you add a node and you add the same node again. It should know that it already has it, or the same disk. And, but it wasn't as much a big deal because this is not a human interface, it's for services, but it, we still need to make sure we have, to, uh, have that feature. The really cool features later are what to do when something fails. So for example, let's say you have your, vo your many, many volumes all over, and then one of the nodes die. And Keddy gets informed, node whatever ID died. It can go ahead, allocate new bricks automatically, update all the volumes, and everybody will be fine. So even if you wanted to say, I want to take this, uh, I want to upgrade the amount of RAM on this system, so you can just tell Heketi, this failed, so it pulls everything away from it, it grab the system, put in a new RAM, put it in, and then tell it again, and it, uh, it can use it again. And lastly, uh, I know there's a project called uh, GlusterFS 4.0. And in that project, there will be a new REST interface to Gluster D. Right now, we have to SSH into the system to, tell, uh, to communicate with Gluster. But it would be great to have this REST interface with uh, Heketi. OK? That's all I have.
And this is it. If all these slides are available up there on that link. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? For creating a topology? Yeah. Yeah, again, if you if you create your own program for your own discovery tool, maybe you can use UDP, for example, in your systems to find out new nodes. Maybe you have your own software that when you plug in automatically sends a UDP packet or, or registers with some uh, registration system, you can use that information to it. But Hikari itself, I think I I'm trying to keep it very simple. Because every different data center, it has a different requirements on discovery. Yeah, usually often you have to okay, same, every case is different, but in the same organization, often you try to replicate uh, the same configuration over and over and over again. Yeah. If you can say, example, all the, all the servers are in this range, are in this zone, yeah. and we are able to say, on what the remote of, okay, has this IP, yeah. so I'm, I, I guess those are one of the things that we need to whiteboard to understand how that can be done. Do you know of any existing such services that already try to find out, to discover through the network, like you said? So uh, do I know any such services to discover? It depends on the size of the data center. So there's, uh, if you use, I think it's SMP for MIP for discovery, that's one way. But uh, I know a very easy one to do for uh, small uh, data centers is UDP broadcast. It's very simple. So I'm talking integrated with, uh, with this tool. Yes. Right? It's something that just goes on and discovers, creates a JSON file, and passes over. You know what we really need is to be able to use uh, some discovery service with a cloud model. So if I can talk to the cloud and find out the nodes, I'll find out information. <coughs> I was just wondering if you know one that exists already or everybody no, has I don't like one. Well, we can talk to that guy back there. Find out. Right, thank you. Well, I don't know. I just have a question. Uh, do you think that uh, cluster FS is architecturally robust enough to be elastic in the cloud itself? I mean, oh, God, you're putting me on the spot. I know. Uh, that's a good question. So the question is, do I think that GlusterFS is robust enough to be able to deploy in the cloud in this model, creating many, many, many volumes that are small and creating many volumes at a time uh, concurrently and changing. and changing the sizes and such? I do not know how to answer, answer that. I would have to, let me put it this way. This is a new, storage as a service is a new model for, for GlusterFS and it would need to be investigated to see how uh, well, it can handle it. I don't know how good, it, well, it can handle it. I don't know how bad it can handle it. But I think it's an, uh, it's an unknown that we need to answer. Yeah, yeah. Shabba? Um, once you start creating your volumes and everything, you're building a lot of um, intelligence yes. into the Hikari database. Mm -hmm. So that's a great question, actually. Let me go back. Let me go back here. Today, Hikari uses an internal Go. Hikari is written in Go, and it uses a database called BoltDB, which is a really good database for simple applications. It is a key value transactional database, copy and write B3 kind of thing. Uh, which works really well when you're trying to do things and you're trying to back out of them. So you could do something and you could realize that you fail halfway and you fail that transaction, your database still stays clean. So you could do many things at a time in, uh, on an entire transaction. Now, it is a single point of failure. If the database fails, you will lose all of that data. So today, we have to put that bolt DB on something that is safe, um, but it, we, didn't, we can definitely change that in the future. Yeah. Very much related to that, do you have a way of importing existing cluster environments into this database? No. We cannot import, and that for sure, we cannot import 
existing cluster environments in the system because existing cluster environments have an infinite number of combinations and permutations of how they were created. So I'm talking about the, the hardware, the disk, the storage, not the volume itself. So we would have to go into the volume and find out how the disk was created and, and find out, you know, one of the things that Hecate does, for example, is to make sure that everything's aligned when it creates the file system. So there's a lot of things that it would need to do before it actually can take over a, a, an existing system. So I'm not saying it's impossible, but it would be really hard. So. I'm sorry. Yeah, conflict detection. Yes. No, 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 no. It's in the plan. It's actually the next thing I'm going to do. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. That needs to be done. Yes. And the last one that you turn off goes away? That, again, is an idea. Okay. It, it, it's not uh, something that we have set in stone. And, uh, but it's, def it's definitely we can have a uh, talk about. And lastly, it's everything that's available on here on GitHub. If you have any questions, uh, you can go to Hecate, uh on GitHub, and it, there's a channel there for uh, Gitter. And you can ask all the questions you want on there that people can see and I'll be able to answer. All right? Thank you very much. Last reminder for lightning talk, last chance to go and Could you create a presentation? Could you please upload me slides? Uh, they're not in, P in PDF format. Yeah. They're in, um, in Go and they're only available online. Okay, so you can export it. Yeah, they're only available there. Uh, let me help you with that in a second. Okay. Yeah, hold on. This is yours. All right. I'm talking about Ganesha, yes. Okay, I'm normally there. I'm sorry. All right. Dude, sorry, one small comment. Yeah. You're using the flag library, aren't you? The what? The flag library. The what library? The first CLI oh, person. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You gotta rip that out. That's the Go flag yeah, library. Garbage, it's complete garbage. Oh, you do what? You want me to just let go? Why? Because of dash dash and thing like that? Yeah, you have to use a proper library. Like, okay. code it's gangsta, well. I know it's crap. No one uses it. Oh, really? Yeah, it's crap. Oh. Right? You know what I'm talking about. The single dash thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what, that's what Go chose. Uh, that's it's garbage. Yeah, I only like to say something about yeah. it. Yeah. That's JSON, right? Yeah, no. The, no, it's Go language. It's a Go language thing. Yeah. If I, it is native for their like simple tools. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. They have to have one, yeah. but no one uses it. Everyone uses like. Code Gangsta okay. is one that I'm using, but okay. there's another one that's also just as good. I'm sure. I'll, I'll use whatever. I'll change I'm it. not like... Whoosh. No, man. I'll change it. It's easy. I'm just like telling you a small <laughs> thing. No, someone has to tell you these things. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. You could... I'll